All right, everybody. Let's talk about something that usually scares the pants off a lot of people, and that's something called quantum mechanics. I'm not going to focus on this very much because it can get very high, uh, it can get very in depth as far as the math is concerned, and I'm not going to go that route in the slightest. I am using quantum mechanics purely as a tool in this video to explain to you how electrons are arranged inside an atom inside things called orbitals. Now, uh, this video is um, has as basis the Bohr model of the atom that I touched on in the previous video. So make sure that you've watched that one and you have a basic idea about what that is like before you watch this. And that last video was called the emission spectrum and the Bohr model, I think it was. So just to start off with, let's let's have an analogy here. Ultimately, this video was concerned about electrons and where they are inside an atom. And the analogy here is, here we've got Mark McGuire, I think. Looks like maybe before you started taking lots of steroids. But anyway, any time you have the pitcher throwing the ball and you have the batter here, he has the thing called the strike zone, which, you know, he is, he is going to hit a certain amount of the time, or the uh, pitch is going to throw it there a certain amount of the time. You can never say exactly sure, uh, for sure, whether or not the the the, the pitch is going to throw it there and the bat is going to hit it there. But you can come up with, based on um, estimates, you can come up with a probability distribution of where you think the ball is going to be, where it might be located. Okay. And in the same way, you can come up with um, probability distributions in an atom for where electrons might be located. And these probability distributions in terms of atoms are called orbitals. So all they are are probability distributions. All right, they're not real physical things. They are, they have been essentially um, thought up by people to try and explain where electrons are inside an atom. And of course, where electrons are inside an atom define why an atom reacts the way it does. Essentially, these define pretty much everything to do with chemistry, so they're really kind of important. Now, in order for us to understand about these orbitals, we have to understand the method by which they are labeled and how we can talk about them. And the things that are used to label these are called quantum numbers. All right. Just as you use numbers to label all sorts of things, quantum numbers are labels where electrons are located inside an atom. But not only do they talk about location, they talk about the size, the type, and the number of these orbitals present. If you can get a good understanding of these quantum numbers and what they mean, your understanding of electron configurations in the next chapter will be infinitely easier. All right, that's really important. So make sure you have as, go as good a grasp of this as you can get. So I'm just going to start going through a little bit about each of these quantum numbers, and then we'll move on to an application of them. All right, so the different types of quantum numbers. There's three different types that we want to be concerned with right now. They all have their own names, symbols, and what they describe. So we use, to describe an orbital, we use parts of each of these quantum numbers. All right. Now this, I made a little mistake here. This should be M sub L, M little L there. So let's talk about the first one, and the most important one, because this is where all the other quantum numbers come from. Principal quantum number is N. That's its symbol. All right. This describes the size and energy of the orbital. All right. And it can have different values, anything from one up to whatever. It just can't be zero. So just imagine that's your the outside of your onion. Maybe imagine this is an onion. The size of the onion. And that onion is comprised of lots of rings. 
All right. Like so. Each one of these rings represents a value of n. Kind of, if, we, if we're doing an analogy of this. When we get to the next quantum number, it's called the angular momentum quantum number. It has the symbol L. Describes the shape of the orbital. And it also has possible values as well. The values of L are dictated by the values of n. So if we had a value of n equals 3, we have several possible values of L. The lowest is 0, and the highest is n minus 1. So therefore, in this case, the highest would be 3 minus 1, which is 2. And if we think about it, the n describes the shape of the initial uh, onion layer. And if we then go in further here, if we were to take a microscope to this onion, we'd see that each of these layers, this, this layer here, is actually comprised of lots of sub-layers. Alright, so that is kind of that blown up. And that's what this L describes. All right? It breaks N down into smaller pieces. So this is the first level, this is the second level, this is where we get even more detail. All right, so N, like I said, it describes the size and energy of the orbital. L describes the shape, and we'll, uh, and we'll talk more about specific shapes later on. We're not going to get into a huge amount of detail about it. And then we have the, the magnetic Compton number, M sub L. This describes the orientation of the orbital in three dimensions. Possible values range from plus L to minus L. All right, now make sure you guys understand. This is, um, okay, I've used Times New Roman here, and uh, I probably made it a little bit difficult. That's L, and that's L, that's L, and that's L, just so there's no confusion here. So possible values of M sub L are from plus L to minus L. So if we have a value of L equals zero, the only value possible for m sub l is 0. If we have a value of l equals 1, we can have values from plus 1 through 0 to minus 1. If we have a value of l equals 2, we can have plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, and minus 2. Now, what this all means, when we get down to this level here, each of these different numbers represents an orbital. So when we talk about n equals 3, we've got three values of L here. And ultimately we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 orbitals that fit under this n equals 3 umbrella. Each orbital can fit two electrons for a total of 18 electrons. So what I've done here, I'm I'm showing this is just a diagram from the textbook. It's just what I said arranged in a slightly cleaner way. If you have a value of n equals 1, the only possible value for L is 0. Therefore, only 0 for um, m sub L. When you have a value of n equals 2, and you're getting slightly higher energy here, this is bigger, further, more diffuse, you can have two different values of L. L equals 0 and L equals 1. When you have a value of n equals 3, you can have an L equals 1, L equals 0, 1, or 2. And each of these values of m sub L are dependent on the above value of L. Now, the only thing that's different here that I need to add is about these letters. I haven't really touched on these yet. Each value of L has its own number. And to avoid complication with the values of N and L, each of these different values of L has been assigned a letter that kind of talks about the shape of each orbital. When you have an L value of 0, it corresponds to the letter S. An S orbital is just spherical. All right, we have 1s that might look something like this. 
and we have 2s which is spherical as well but it's just bigger just as we have 3s here which is bigger all right so the 1 here comes from the n value the s comes from the l value so that's s orbitals when we have a value of l equals 1 that corresponds to p orbitals and notice there are three values of m sub l here that means three orbitals the p orbitals look like dumbbells one goes up and down one goes left and right and then one comes I'm trying to show that coming towards you and going away from you um, y-axis x-axis z-axis so these exist in three in uh, across three different planes there but the important thing is when you have a value of l equals one that corresponds to p orbitals you can have two p orbitals and three p orbitals as well you can't have any one p orbitals here because there's no value of l equals one and then when we get to the 3d orbital I'm not going to focus too much on this when you have an L equals 2 that corresponds to your d orbitals um, and those orbitals are more complicated I'm not going to get too much into them but most of them look like this some of them look a little different but anyway there is five of them so the higher the number the higher the energy from this value of n uh, the higher the value of L, the different value of S you get, either S or the different value of L, either S, P, D, or F, if we go further. The thing that this means is, for each different value of L, we can talk about how many orbitals are in there, and thus build up how many orbitals we have in total inside an atom. So here we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. From n equals 1 to n equals 3, we have 14 orbitals in total. That's a lot of orbitals. So here's a question. Based on what we've just gone through, what are the quantum numbers and names of the orbitals in the n equals 5 principal level? And how many n equals 5 orbitals exist? Well, all we're going to do is what we've done here. So let's see if we can do that. So we start off saying we know our n is equal to 5. All right, let me get a different color. We know if n is 5, the first thing we want to do is say, well, what are our values of L? Well, L ranges from 0 to n minus 1. So in this case, we have one possible value of L is 0. 1 would be 1. 1 would be 2. 1 would be 3. and the last would be 4. So now we've done this, we should look at our values of m sub l. When we have a value of l equals 0, the only possible value of m sub l is also 0. When we have a value of l equals 1, we can say because m sub l goes from plus l to minus l, we can say we have plus 1, 0, minus 1. When we go to m l equals, uh, l equals 2, our values for m l become like so. Notice as the value of l increases, the value, the number of possible m l's also increases. So I'm just going to keep on writing these out. And then for our m sub l, we can say this, plus 4, plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and minus 4. Notice as we increase in l, our values of m l increases. And because our number of different values of m l increases, our number of possible orbitals increases which shouldn't really be a surprise because each of these is getting bigger as the value of L gets bigger. Now we've got to talk about the names of these orbitals. The, the quantum numbers we have, we have done here. 
and names. Now, when it came to names, we're talking about 1s, 2s, or whatever. But we know our n is 5. So therefore, all our quantum number names are going to begin with 5. We're going to have a name here, a name here, a name here, a name here, and a name here. You remember for a value of L equals 0, we said that corresponded to uh, the letter S. When we had an L equals 1, that corresponded to the letter P. For L equals 2, those are the d orbitals. We haven't seen the others yet. These are f and these are g. They get more complex as they get bigger, as you would imagine. How many n equals 5 orbitals exist? Well, remember, that's determined by the number of values of m sub l. So we've got 1 here. We've got 1, 2, 3 here. We've got 5 here. We've got 3, 4, 7 here. And we've got 3, 6, 9 here. Add all those numbers together, 9, 16, 21, 24, 25 orbitals. All right. Now, I know that's right, because the other way you can check the number of orbitals is to say the number of orbitals should be equal to the value of n squared. n is 5, 25. All right. So you can see the value of n initially dictates the value of L. The value of L dictates the value of m sub L. So we couldn't have something like m sub L equals minus 2 here because the, we can't have that coming from a value of L equals 0. All right. OK, so that's a little bit about those, how you can figure out those types of orbitals. Last question here, which of the following sets of quantum numbers is incorrect? Based on what we've talked about here, the rules that we've gone through, and what we've seen in the past, which is incorrect. Well, if we have n equals 3, we can have values of L to be 2, 1, or 0. So that seems to be OK. If I have a value of, ML of L equals 0, ML equals 0 is also OK. So that one's all right. If I have n equals 2, I can have L equals 0 or 1. That's OK. If I have L equals 1, I can have ML from plus 1, 0, and minus 1. So that is also OK. N equals 1. My only possible value of L is 0. My only possible value of M sub L is also 0. So the fourth one must be the one that's wrong, but let's check. N equals 4. I can have values of L as 3, 2, 1, or 0. So 1 is OK. If I have a value of L equals 1, my values of M sub L can be plus 1, 0, or minus 1. Notice minus 2 is not a possibility. So therefore, that's not OK. And, those, and that set of quantum numbers is incorrect. All right, so that is a bit about quantum numbers and how we can use them to figure out where electrons go inside an atom. All right.